I still have uh -oh. trouble from force. Okay, we're going to get started tonight. Troubles for everybody. Yeah. Tonight is uh, Monday, April 22nd, and this is a regular school board meeting. Okay, two different years. And Janet, could you start with roll call? <coughs> Here. Reed Campbell? Here. Tom Hagler? Here. Sue Kern? Here. Ruth Nelson? Here. Bob Nystrom? Here. All present? Thank you. And we're going to go ahead with the Pledge of Allegiance. It's a different. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. We're going to go ahead with the approval of the agenda as amended. We added in the uh, Benefits Committee meeting update as well as the groundbreaking dates. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Now is the time when we have our public input. Um, and we welcome your comments. If there's somebody who wanted to come forward, we do limit it to a three minute discussion. Um, we don't receive any allegations or complaints regarding students or any of our staff. We follow board policy 206. And just so you know, there will be no interaction back and forth. Is there anybody who wanted to come forward tonight? Come on up. You can just have a seat there. Thank you. Okay, so I suppose I should introduce myself. I'm a senior at Brainerd High School. I am the captain of the speech and debate team. And I'm here today to like address a few concerns that I have that I see as like overarching trends within the district. First, I'm going to talk about technology in the classrooms, second, class sizes, and finally some issues with the arts and academics. So first, the technology in the classroom. Google Classroom is a really helpful tool. Like, it really helps students connect with their teachers, like when they're gone or if they want additional information. But unfortunately, I've been privy to some discussions that show that it isn't necessarily as helpful as we might think it is. I was leaving debate practice one evening, and there was a young man standing in the door waiting to be picked up. And he was on the phone with what I can only assume to be his mother, and he was discussing how he couldn't turn in his English assignments over the long break because he would be at his dad's house, and his dad's house has no internet. And so what I got from that is that even if we have the one-to-one -one student device ratio, ultimately people will still fall through the cracks. And these people that already feel alienated because, again, look at how many students are on free or reduced lunch, they're going to continue to struggle with these issues. And so while Google Classroom is very helpful and a very good addition to regular classroom instruction, I personally have both felt and observed that it's being used too often to replace traditional methods, especially considering that multiple studies have been done, one of which I have cited, but I will not mention for fear of time, that when you write things down, you actually synthesize and process the information more Whereas on Google Classroom, if you're just typing an assignment or analyzing a document, you don't synthesize that information. And so personally, from many of my teachers, I've actually written assignments instead of typed them in order to like, actually learn the information more. And then second, overcrowding or classroom sizes. From the outside, from an outsider's perspective, sometimes it almost seems like there aren't enough teachers to teach certain electives. I have known dozens of students, and the numbers seem to be fairly high, people that have signed up for art electives especially, but haven't been placed in those classes and have instead been sent to a study hall. And I myself am one of those students. I actually have two open hours and a student aid hour because the art classes that I wanted to take, there were only one or two sections and there's only one teacher that's able to teach those classes. Unfortunately, the pottery room does sit empty for at least one hour per day that I know of and there are dozens upon dozens of students that want to take these art classes, but it seems almost like there aren't enough teachers to teach them. But again, that's just an outsider's perspective. I'm sure there's some other workings beneath the surface, 
but just from like a student's like within the school perspective, that's just what it seems like. And when we have this, these new buildings coming and all these exciting changes, that's great. And I'm kind of excited for the new buildings, even though I won't be here to see them. But sometimes I think we need to remember that ultimately our schools are only good, as good as the staff we have within them. Like we could have the most expensive, most beautiful building possible, but if there aren't teachers in the rooms, it really doesn't seem like that serves me as a student or other students to like the best means possible. And then finally, like the academics and arts overall, I of course am a huge advocate for speech and debate. And honestly, they've give, those programs have given me skills that are like irreplaceable. I'm going to nationals for the fourth time this at the beginning of this summer. And my debate coaches have taught me life lessons and they've really mentored and advocated for me all throughout high school. And it really saddens me that it looks like we're not going to have a debate program next year due to the fact that there will not be a coach in order to carry on the legacy of the team. And so that's basically my three major concerns, technology, class sizes, and the fact that we might not have a speech and debate team moving forward. So I thank you for your time. Could I get your name again, please? Maddie Schuld. Maddie Schuld. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who wanted to talk to us tonight? Come on up. Hello, my name is Dave Pritchett. I'm a teacher at Forest View. I'm also the debate coach that she's talking about that's resigning this year. I taught her well. She did three yeah, points. <laughs> <laughs> Packed evidence. You know, it was great. Um, it feels weird to be on the other side of the mic from some of you. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, what I'm here for is I'm really hoping that you'll either rescind the approval of the minutes or vote against the consent calendar, especially item 7A with the staff changes and specifically for Steve Petrick. Um, he's an experienced teacher. I mean, like I've written the board and I, you know, and like I've, I've written to you, Tom, that, you know, I know the difference between management and, and you know, and governance. And I think in a situation where you've had constituents bring up concerns, that it's something that's worth discussing. You know, there's a difference between you didn't do what I wanted you to and you didn't listen to me. If you discuss it and you decide in a way different than the way I see it, at least you listen to me. If it's not discussed, I know you don't have to give a reason to release an untenured teacher, but there should be a reason for, for releasing an untenured teacher, especially one of the caliber that he is. When we go to the, the coaching things, like I've said, it's almost impossible to get good debate coaches or debate coaches, period, in the cities, much less in Brainerd. And here's somebody that you have that has taken kids to nationals, has had a state champion, is familiar with our program because he's competed against our program for years and years and years. Um, so, you know, that's basically what, I, you know, usually there's some sort of a red flag or a problem or a numbers thing, and I'm not privy to all the information. But I would just ask you, you know, there's a couple of options, you know, you can, you can offer another probationary year. There's, a, you know, a, a few things that you can discuss to, before you make that decision to terminate that position. And thank you very much for your time and consideration. Yeah, and glad we were able to get all the school stuff through on city council, too. So. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> we're going to talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> all right, thank you. Is there anyone else tonight that would like to come forward for public comment? Seeing none, we'll move ahead forward. Building project update. Brandon and Justin, or just Justin? It's gonna be Justin and Brad, mostly, I think, or just maybe, maybe just Justin. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, well, prior to going through the updates on the Baxter projects, I'd like to commend Lane's involvement on this whole conditional use permit process. A lot of late meetings, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of extra effort has been Pretty, pretty incredible. Also want to thank Brad, Brad's involvement in the city of Baxter's involvement. They've been true partners throughout this whole process. So going through Baxter Elementary, um, last week we were issued the conditional use permit. So that, that went pretty well. And I do want to introduce Al Ryko. He's our, he's our site superintendent on this project. So you'll see, see a lot of Al moving forward here. So we've been working on issuing contracts to all the contractors. We have issued them and just general coordination, trying to dial in the schedule and, and uh, get ready for the, for the start. 
Our pre-construction meeting scheduled for this Thursday, the 25th. And uh, our groundbreaking ceremony is uh, May, May 21st, as I, I noticed this in the, the agenda as well. And um, the intent is to start construction June 3rd, no, no later than June 3rd. Yay. The Jasper Wood and Noah and Mapleton. So that project has been approved by council. It's being, being spearheaded by, by the city. And that's uh, the, the intent is to commence on that project in July. Forest View Middle School. So we, we were granted amended conditional use permit last week um, with, a, with a condition and just wanna to touch base on what that condition is. So SPAC, WSN's traffic consultant, our traffic consultant um, is working with the city's traffic consultant trying to reach a consensus. So we're trying to, we're trying to work through what exactly is required to get rid of that condition on the, the amended CUP. Do you want to explain what the condition is? Yeah, a little bit so, so the board of education. So, so the condition, the condition is um, so northbound traffic on on Norwood. There'd be a, we're trying to determine if we need to have a right turn lane or not. It would expand the road, and we'd have a right turn lane. Um, cost impact could be anywhere from fifty to sixty thousand dollars potentially. Uh, we're still trying to work through those details, but yeah, essentially northbound traffic. We're trying to determine if we have to have a right turn lane to keep traffic moving. That makes sense. Okay. Is it just one right turn be, lane? It'd be, or two, would it be two. Be two of them. Yep, two of them. And uh, so, yeah, prior to May seventh, we're trying to clarify. Try to clarify that. So May seventh is the next board meet or city board meeting, and we, we're hoping to have that clarified and that that condition removed. Yep. And and uh, just want to reiterate that. The, um, this condition on the CUP is not affecting the con or the Forest View project uh, or the, uh, the contractors involved. So that'd be outside of the Forest View project. This turn lane would be with the, the Jasper and Noah and Mapleton piece that the, that the city is taking care of or uh, spearheading rather. And uh, contracts have been issued for, for Forest View to all the contractors. <coughs> And um, our pre-construction meeting is also on the, on the 26th, the, this, this coming Thursday. And we're intending on starting construction June 3rd. <coughs> Any questions for me? It's real. So I'd like to invite Brad, Brad to come up here and give a quick update from his Justin, perspective. Yes. You said um, you needed a right-bound turn lane on North Nowood. Northbound. Uh, we're trying to determine if we need it or not. Wouldn't it be southbound? No. Nope. Northbound. Oh, northbound left. Left, I'm sorry. Yes, oh. you have. A, I'm sorry. Yeah, you oh. would have a bypass lane essentially. Yes. That makes okay. Sense. Yeah. Oh, it'd be in the in the center. It'd right? be in the center. I'm sorry. Yeah. There is one going. To there the is one. one. Correct. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. From Brad. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Oh, okay. I guess he's good. Yeah, just that. You get two chairs. Yeah, two chairs. <laughs> well, I don't have that big of an ego, so it's <laughs> necessary. But I uh, want to thank uh, the school board as well as the leadership of the administration, Superintendent Larson, CFO uh, Lord, uh, for bringing us to the point. Um, our meeting last Tuesday night didn't get the publicity that your meeting the night before had in regards to reaching a milestone, but on Tuesday night was a very large meeting. Not only did the CUP and the approvals for the site go forward, but also the city council did uh, act on the purchase agreement and the related documents. So on behalf of the city, we are excited to moving forward with you. We know it's been a process, but uh, we are excited to be um, standing beside you and working towards having a Class A facility uh, elementary school for the city of Baxter, within the city of Baxter. So, Great. Very good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for all your hard work. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your vision and your leadership. And we're excited. You're excited. Yeah, we are excited. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Do you see any issues? Have you talked to your engineers at all about that? left turn no. when you're going north have you heard anything at all this week since i know that last thursday spac uh, consultants as well as our uh, con contracted uh, traffic engineer uh, did meet to discuss it the outcome of that meeting i am not uh, privy to at this moment i okay. know that a letter is supposed to follow uh, but in context of uh, the process is is 
It's a trust but verify, and we're at the verify point. Um, SPAC did do a level of service to a point uh, that talked about the larger global uh, transportation system, uh, but the final designs of the site weren't finished. So we needed to go back to make sure that there would not be need, needing any additional improvements based upon the final site design on the sites itself. And that's the point we're at, is, is getting that verification and determining if any other improvements on the right of way need to be done. Um, the easiest way to describe it in layman's term is every year you approve an annual report from your financial officer and usually make that approval contingent upon an audit. <laughs> this is that audit point. And, and depending upon the, the outcome of that audit, we need to make adjustments on how we move forward. I think it's safe to say that if we find out, you know, we want to do that assessment now, like we talked about the other day, I think it was Thursday that we had that meeting, that we really do want to make sure that we do it right the first time, and so that not five years down the road do we need to be making changes, and so we appreciate that the due diligence that all of you guys are taking to make sure that we do it right when we do it this time. Doing it right now is the most cost effective. Yeah, right. It's needed. Right. So. So, thank you. Very thank good. You. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. <coughs> Next up, approval of minutes from the April 8th regular school board meeting. I'll so move. Thank you. Second. Charles. Okay, we have a first from Director Nelson, the second from Director Blacklands. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. And the April 15th special school board meeting minutes. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. We have a first from Director Haglin, a second from Director Nystrom. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Next up, the consent calendar. I'll move the approval of the consent calendar. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Just a quick comment that uh, I appreciate both uh, speakers today that I do want to make sure that we can wonderful debate team that we've had or program we want to make sure that uh, we don't skip a beat with that moving forward with this change thank you for that thank comment <clears throat> I, I believe that every board member or almost every board member has talked with superintendent Lar Larson today so we have had discussion individually okay. Okay. I, do, I do have a process question um, with, with the community input and i um, not sure if this is the place to bring it up, but since I'm fairly new, it's probably the time to do it, is when, when a community member processes or shares something, when is the board's time to, to process that? Right now. Right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So... I guess my, my question would be, um, so, so, it, so now is the time, if there's any of us that had any further questions, this is what, where we would be, be bringing them forward, right, with them. Right. Okay. If I have questions on the board, on board work or whatever, I come in and I talk to the person before I come to the meeting. All right, thank I you. I, have, I understand that. I mean, okay. from, the, from what they shared. If they if they bring up a question and, and it pings a question for me, now is the time to, to bring that forward. So is your question for Superintendent Larson? No, it's just a process question. I just want to make sure that this process, when the community input brings brings something forward, that we make sure that we that we actually honor them and and uh, right. process it if need be. Okay. And just to clarify too, I mean, there's times where someone might bring something forward that has nothing to do with the agenda that evening. So, it, you know, I might get assigned later on for some further discussion. Okay. Later on in, in a meeting. But okay. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. 
fortunately or unfortunately, if any any input now where it's an agenda item and, and action has been taken is you know, it's an opportunity to still visit about. And that's where the window seems tight. So, yeah, I get that. So other times it might be brought up and we'd have more time to Yeah, process. we used to have committee meetings. Yeah, that, um, sure. Previous structure would have helped with the committee. Yeah, all kinds of really separate helped. just that, that topic and talk about it in committee, but we don't have those. Okay. All right. Sometimes people might choose to table it too until the next meeting or something like that to collect more information if they feel that they need to do that. So okay. there are some options that way too. So that's a good question. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, we have a motion on the table. Um, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Site reports and communications. District bullying prevention update. Heidi Hahn, John Anderson, and Jean Martin. this one so at a request earlier um, in the month we were asked to revisit our bullying prohibition policy so what we'd like to do with you this evening is just quick review that and then I asked mr. John Anderson principal of Forest View Middle School as well as mr. John Clark principal of Riverside Elementary um, and Jean Martin from Riverside to join us unfortunately due to uh, family circumstances mr. Clark isn't able to be with us this evening but we have his information to bring forward are we okay? You're good. Okay, you can't hear me. Okay. So just, just for review, um, policy 514 is our bullying prohibition policy. And the intent of our policy really is to create a safe and civil environment with our students. Um, we've had lots of attention coming to bullying just because of, uh, most recently Facebook postings and things like that have been occurring. What's difficult, I think, a lot of times when we get into these situations, and that's why I feel it's important we have our principals here with us, is truly understanding the definition of bullying a very complex um, issue so the definition we have in policy means that it's intimidating threatening abusive or harming conduct that is objectively offensive and there's an actual or perceived imbalance of power that exists between typically the two students involved it's a repetitive pattern and it interferes with the students educational opportunity or performance so anytime we get a report of bullying that's where we go first is does it meet the definition of that or is it just a conflict between students or unfortunately, is it just one student being mean to another student? So when we work with students, we really look at that definition. Because when we spend lots of time together in close quarters, just like family members, sometimes we end up in disagreements. Um, reporting procedure for that, once a report is made to a building administrator or supervisor, from our school district policy, we have three days to begin an investigation and report uh, regarding that incident. In addition, the alleged perpetrator is allowed to provide information lots of times we get reports and, and the person being accused isn't even aware of what's happening we'll ensure that appropriate action is taken once that investigation is done um, and we'll make sure that the action uh, interrupts the bullying or interferes or prohibits that continued action to take place um, hard part for parents when they're they're very emotionally attached with their students is we cannot disclose the student um, private data so if there is a consequence assigned <clears throat> You know both sides don't necessarily get to understand that or know that information so any questions any questions for mr. Anderson um, our school administrators spend lots and lots of time working with students in regards to conflicts and bullying um, situations the biggest thing when I've talked to our building principals what they really need to know is they don't know what's going on until somebody lets them know what's going on at times so some of the accusations that have been made haven't even been brought forth to the attention of a building administrator. So any report that's been, um, that comes to our office or to the, the building administrator's office, we take immediate action because we're significantly concerned about our student safety. In addition, Reichert's has been phenomenal. 
Um, I think Elsie and Bob have spent hundreds of hours watching bus video, so that's been the gift of having video on buses as we can then go review um, different interaction situations or accusations that have been made. The one thing I did want to bring, and that's why I've asked Mr. Anderson to join us, is we have a lot of positive things that are happening in our district um, in regards to really creating strong developmental relationships among our students and our staff within the buildings. Thus, my casual dress this evening, I'm representing Riverside Elementary. Their major focus this year is they've started um, the Be the Nice Kid project, um, and it's based around this original poem that I put up there, so I'm going to read it to you. And if you walk into Riverside, you'll see this right to the right when you enter into their building. It says, some kids are smarter than you, some kids have cooler clothes than you, some kids are better at sports than you. It doesn't matter. You have your thing too. Be the kid who can get along. Be the kid who is generous. Be the kid who is happy for other people. Be the kid who does the right thing. Be the nice kid. Um, this has been uh, ongoing, and if you honestly, if you haven't been in the building, you should go. There are regular events. By grade level, each kid has a different color shirt. Um, it's one of the things that they've done to collectively bring their students together. And underneath, you can say it, it says Building Future Warriors. And then staff have a purple shirt, so they've done, um, they've actually enclosed in a big rainbow. But they're learning social emotional skills when they have this time together, and they're learning what it means to be a friend. They're learning peaceful ways to manage conflict. Um, other examples of this, just so you know, uh, we have social thinking that's happening up at NISPON. If you see Molly Rasky's data that she's collected on just how students are interacting and the decrease that they've seen in um, office referrals or discipline referrals, conflicts, significant reduction. Just from that, Garfield Elementary is doing responsive classroom. I know Tammy's in the back. They've had a huge uh, kindness project going on at Baxter. So there are concerted efforts throughout our district really focusing on positive relationships, which we know then decreases our incidences of Conflict, um, bullying, and just look at it, Mr. Anderson. Keep popping to your slides. I believe. Right. So um, I asked Mr. Anderson to be here because one of the initiatives that started at Forest View is actually the advisor advisee program. And he's going to give you a little bit more information about that. Again, the focus is really getting students to connect with one another and have a positive relationship <laughs> with staff in the building. Great. I thought I was just here for support. I don't know if I had to talk. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks again for inviting me here to talk a little bit about this. You have the, the PowerPoint on your screens, correct? Yeah, I'll go through a few things. Uh, but to uh, repeat a little, a uh, couple points that Heidi had talked about, um, again, prevention <coughs> and intervention. You know, it, that's kind of the both sides of, of where we want to be. Um, the first part of the slide, we talk about what we have in policy and how that lives out and what we with kids and situations. And then the other piece of it is putting social emotional tools in kids' toolboxes. And so that's where you look at those things with elementary. This is one piece of, of what we do at Forest Street Middle School to do that. Um, there's been a couple of years in the making to create a powerful, meaningful experience for kids to address social emotional needs. And again, to put social emotional tools in their toolbox. Um, as we know, um, through that phase for fifth through eighth grade, there's monumental change cognitively, physically, emotionally. Um, and so it's kind of with a little bit of pride that our staff uh, that said, you know what, systemically, we have 25 minutes every week to designate to social emotional learning and connectivity. So um, this is the thing that we put together. This is right out of a, a parent handout to say, okay, how do we boil down what's advisory? Um, to anybody walking on the street. Here it is. Um, we provide students with regular opportunities for interaction with small groups of peers and a caring adult to produce two things. And this is what we talk with staff about. If you are within the goalposts of these two things in your advisory, we are doing advisory the right way. One, sound positive relationships between students and adults. We want our kids to connect with the other kids in that advisory class, and we want the adult to connect positively and have a great relationship uh, with those kids. Create relationships. Second, social emotional learning, tools in the toolbox for kids, positive growth in students, social emotional and personal development. So um, we provide opportunities for staff and students to, to do some things so they can uh, get to know each other a little better and, and build those relationships. But we also have um, a foundation of lessons that are in relation to those social emotional personal development. That packet that I handed out was just random things that I, I took from 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th 
um, from our uh, advisory curriculum that was written over last summer and tweak throughout the year. So what it is, again, it's once a week for 25 minutes. We um, make sure that we have small groups of students, 20 or less, um, which means we have all hands on deck with that. We meet with our advisor um, and uh, to build those relationships with their advisor and to improve those lifelong skills. Um, all counseling staff, all administration have an advisory group, so it's been great for me to do that. We just made a commitment that you know every Monday from 825 to to 850, we put everything on hold, and it's time for advisory. And in fact, the, uh, the office staff will say, it just gets so quiet around here on Monday mornings from 825 to 850. So that is uh, the, really the, the flyover version of, of what adv advisory is at Forest View. Um, what we cover, um, and there are lessons in all of those things that, we, that we've covered thus far. Goal setting, study skills, conflict resolution, bullying, prevention, communication, social media awareness. Respect, kindness, time management, persistence, and others. We hit those, those developmentally appropriate issues. We took um, all of February, for example, and we talked about what, uh, relationship skills, empathy, listening skills, showing kindness. Not only fluffy conversations about it, but what does it mean to show kindness? What does it mean to show empathy? What are positive listening skills? Um, I know that doesn't really relate directly to bullying, but it is about putting developmental tools in these kids' toolboxes to deal with situations that come up. Um, again, how do we, how are kids group for advisory? We don't ex exceed 20 kids, and they, for this first year, we determine the best place for kids to stay on their team, uh, stay in their grade level. We looked at different <coughs> options. Do we try to mix up fifth and sixth grade kids, seventh and eighth grade? Uh, for this year, um, that's how we have it. They're, they're all grouped by grade and actually by their team. Just a quick uh, picture um, of kind of the momentum that we've had in advisory. Um, Jessica Motes and Chuck Carlson's advisory um, after February, they said we should do something to invite more advisors, advisory classes um, to carry that momentum of acts of kindness. So they said, can we make a tree and put it in the hallway? Yep, they cut out the leaves. Um, and they handed out packs of leaves to every advisory group and encouraged them to write down over the last couple of weeks what was an act of kindness that they've done for each other, stick it on the tree. Um, I walked my advisory down today and there were four other advisory groups hanging out, reading them, talking about these acts of kindness to create that, that environment. So I just thought I'd show a quick picture of, of that. Um, Part, uh, if we look at the Forestry Way, that's nothing new. That's our PBIS has been around for a number of years, but um, we, we lean on that heavily um, for both sides of the coin of, bet of between prevention and intervention. Um, just outlines the expectations. Embedded into that, um, in that grid, is, is how we should treat each other and what we do when we see bullying. Um, so that's in there. Um, every Monday, Students get a screencast from Principal Anderson, and that's the first thing that's on there. And then we go to another um, uh, developmental lesson. But we keep this as a backdrop of what we expect um, uh, of, of expected behaviors in all those areas of the cloud in, in the school. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, next couple slides. Um, I, I don't know if, if we need to go through this for time, but um, these are all. Uh, sections of cut and paste in from the handbook of which is also reviewed in advisory and through the year during power time so we put a little statement what we believe uh, uh, what we should do for bullying um, the next couple slides then are if it's happening to you we have it here's what here's some recommendations if you see it happening to someone else about the whole bystander effect and then the last one is how to report it and I do believe the last slide <coughs> is a reference back to our policy uh, of what it is. Um, and uh, again, it's those two things. It's that power imbalance, and it's the negative interactions over time. The other follow-up, when I've talked to our building administrators, they have found that each year it becomes more and more challenging because it seems culturally, and especially with social media, the first go-to is negative and conflict and um, lots of angry words and lots of angry exchanges. And so we are finding it more imperative that we spend 
especially at the beginning of the day when you talk to a lot of elementaries too, if it's the responsive classroom or social thinking, they're, they're grabbing those kids right of the way in the day to gather them together, to get them connected, to kind of set that tone for the learning. Um, but it continues to be a significant need. We talk about curriculum changes that we're looking for to make social emotional learning more of a focus for all of our students across all of our grade levels, servicing both birth all the way to 21. I have one question, I, and it's great that we're working on the prevention stuff, but when you do have a bullying conflict and there's repercussions and stuff, do we go back to that, either one of those, let's say it's two, two kids, do we go back to them at a later date ever and follow up and see how things are going? Is that part of the plan? Absolutely. Yep. There's Absolutely. A, lot of, a lot of more of a restorative, kind of restorative yeah. justice or circle that occurs. Okay. Um, several building administrators, it's interesting, there are a lot of things that happen outside that aren't necessarily a school issue that are then brought into school. Yeah. And so then finding that time to necessarily bring different families together to have those discussions of how they can help support. Um, social media can be a wonderful thing, but it can also be a curse and it's very frustrating when <coughs> you a pattern on maybe a cyber or social site and then you go back and it's the student still has access to that. Okay, well I, I know our counselors are so busy based on the report they had, so I just. Yeah, um, and it's, but it's, I think the one thing to be aware of too is it's a concerted effort for all teachers, for all staff, and that's the culture of, you know, buildings are really creating um, creative ways and identities of how to have that all-inclusive, supportive environment. Okay. Okay. So as it relates to circling back in these types <coughs> of situations, well, I definitely understand you can't, can't share the specifics in terms of any type of um, consequences and whatnot, but what I'm hearing you say is with the, with the individual or or individuals that make a complaint or make make a report, there is follow up, mm -hmm. circle back to something has been done, or how is how is that typically? Is it verbal? Is yeah, it yeah? Is um, it an official yeah. process for this? If we see it, we reported about it, or we have other means of knowing about it, we act upon it. So I tell with parents. Um, um, the feedback always is really specific <coughs> to what the situation is. Um, more times than not, it's a relationship problem, not necessarily our definition of bullying. Now, when it is a bullying situation, we have a, a pretty prescribed way of, of, of working through those situations. If it's a relationship problem or conflict, that's where we work with, the, with that restorative um, route. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'm really answering your question. I could go on about both of those things. But, but suffice it to say, when it's a bullying situation, we will, we will have follow-up with both victim and perpetrator. Um, and parent and in, guardian. It, yes, in, in relation to their behavior. Sure. So you know, a lot of times so we might have a parent say, I want to know what happened to the other kid. Um, sure. We have followed through to the letter of policy and what's best for each child. And we have followed through with that. Um, you know, again, as, le uh, as outlined in policy, uh, that's the extent of what we can communicate. But that, I mean, that's a human, it's a human emotion. As a parent, if a kid has been harmed, we want to know what's been done. I, I would want that as a parent. Um, and so uh, we, we take this process very seriously because we owe it to the kids, we owe it to the parents, and we owe it to our school to have a positive learning environment. And so when we hear that it's not, um, uh, we respond. So I like that, that there's follow-up. I appreciate yeah. that. And actually, Mr. Anderson, you shared some of that with me before in a previous conversation, which I appreciated. Um, but with the follow-up is if, if, the, if the behavior persists or the bullying persists, um, am I hearing that, the, that you'll follow up with the person that had been bullied before to say, is everything okay, or are things going yeah, well? Yeah, uh, through our, our students, and I've just talked specifically to Forest here, through our students mm -hmm. support, we're a counseling staff, or admin staff, and, and as you know, our teaming, um, we do have conversations with teens about certain situations of the extent that we can. Um, so it is the full team that is, is supporting kids. If we know that there's, there's some conflict going on, whether it's a, uh, a relationship conflict, we work with staff on that, so let's keep an eye on some kids and let's uh, let's make sure that uh, um, that we're all in know and, and are supportive for those for those kids. Um, we do follow up with if it's a true 
bully victim situation, we do make sure that we keep those victims on the radar and have open lines of communication with the kid and the family. Um, as, you, as you know, that the, the research behind how kids report it, they're real reluctant to talk to adults. We know that. Who do they talk to? They talk to their friends. Um, and again, I'm talking specifically with Forsu, a lot of our pipeline of issues between kids, it's kids coming into the office or telling their, their team teachers or something like that. We know about it, we hear about it, we act upon it. Great, thank you. Uh, just a couple, or one more main question is, as it relates to, to bullying, if it takes place relating to diversity or lifestyle, do we do you feel that we have the capacity within the school district the education and the experience to handle those matters first question second part of that is what happens if a person of color is being is being bullied um, where do, how is that dealt with in terms of um, in that particular area of of, uh, of behavior it takes a village yeah. so when we when we are hear about incidences um, racially charged in nature, um, every time that uh, that those situations may occur, we, we involve family members and guardians about that because we think the first first line uh, our first step is to communicate with family so they're aware of what's going on as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we go through the process. We're um, we receive information that an incident occurred. We start asking questions. We start investigating and get to the bottom of it. We have clear policies and procedures on what we need to do um, in, in those situations. So um, and I, I, I go back to the majority of those times, uh, it's a relationship if, issue. And then they start being real mean to each other. Um, and we, we help them learn from those mistakes and expect that they learn those tough, tough lessons mm -hmm. um, and, and learn from that and change their behavior. And I think to answer your question too, Charles, you know, we really look at the, devel the developmental appropriateness for each age group. And so, you know, some of it's an education piece. You know, if I look at elementary where I've seen all the way at high school when we've had more racially charged issues, there's been law enforcement involved, there's been additional discipline. And we follow policy all the way through. So it can start with just that initial education all the way to um, exclusion expulsion depending on the incident um, but I agree with John I would say 95% of the incidences we're involved in typically is a friendship that now has started to alter very rarely do we see um, you know as you see it in social media a lot that there's this bullying a lot of it is students in conflict and some of the more significant ones because I spent time with mr. Anderson this year is friends they've been friends at some point the friendship has fallen apart and now we're in conflict and I'm just going to be mean so I can hurt your feelings and it just continues to escalate. That's a very different situation and I would say that's a lot of our situations um, where I think when it's really clear cut bullying or if it's a targeted bullying act to um, any protected class, to me that's pretty um, black and white and we can follow that policy. It's the, it's the developmental relationship, friendship, um, happened outside of the school, now it's in school situations that get really complicated. Um, because you just want kids, they want their friendship back, and that's been a struggle. Great. I'm comforted to hear that, that your feelings that it's 95% of the people are, are relationship-based. <clears throat> and uh, in, with, with a time in mind, um, I would still like to learn more or unpack this a little bit more. I understand now is not necessarily the time, but I'm not sure of the process to go for that. But I would definitely like to, to have a conversation more about, about this. Because to be completely honest, I'm concerned about that 5% in terms of in, in what we're doing there. I understand now might, be, might not be the time to completely unpack and that. I, you know, depending on situation, we can give you lots of incidents. But again, it's, it's situational. One incident's one, and we really take it for that rather than trying to do a crossbed because we really want to target that student, how they're feeling, what's happening to ensure the protection and safety of that student too. Yeah, love what you're doing. There's just a little piece there I'm not 100% at ease with just because I'm not not quite understanding it and it's really important that uh, that we continue supporting students the way that you have though thank you any other questions thank you I'm I'm glad you keep the parents in the loop that's oh, important okay. uh, they're at the forefront mm -hmm. yep. so the more we get them involved the better our outcome that's great
Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thank you both. Excited. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Okay, we have a benefits committee update. Tyler McIntosh from regarding the grand rounds with Marcy Lord and Jenny Castle. Director Nelson and I are both on the benefits committee and um, this grand rounds was presented to us and we wanted to bring it forward to the full board so they could hear some of the conversation regarding this. And we're not going to vote on this tonight, but it'll be coming forward in May. Thank you. I would like to introduce Tyler. He is with, um, he is actually going to do the presentation on ground rounds. So the benefits committee was presented ground rounds, which is a, I'm not going to go into the detail that that's for him to do, but um, we are in support of this program. It will hopefully help us save on costs, be a benefit to employees and um, dependents. And um, I'm not sure if your presentation goes through who all, we also elected to have the additional, um, extended family. yes, extended, thank you, extended family uh, added to it as well. So I'm just going to let him take it from there and he can kind of walk you through what Ground Rounds is all about. Isn't it Grand, grand Rounds? Grand Rounds. Yes. You mean Grand, you said yeah. Ground Rounds. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> restaurant? It's a restaurant. Oh. Oh. I came straight from work, I'm kind of hungry. Oh. That's not helping. <laughs> I'm glad you corrected me. Thank you, guys. Sometimes we bring peanuts to the meeting and put them on oh. the table. It gets a little messy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, that happens a lot. It's a tongue twister. Thank you for having me. My name is Tyler McIntosh. I work for Grand Rounds. Uh, it's a San Francisco-based company, but I live uh, in Minnesota in Bloomington and came up this evening, so I really appreciate the opportunity to present to you and tell you more about this benefit program. It's often helpful to understand uh, the genesis of our company, how we started. This is our founder. His name is Dr. Hoffman. He goes by Rusty. He's the chief of interventional radiology at Stanford Hospital in California. He's pictured here with his son Grady, who's about nine years old in this picture. They're at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital and Grady was very ill. They didn't know what was wrong with him. His liver was failing. Uh, he was inpatient for about three weeks and Finally, they did figure out the proper diagnosis. He was diagnosed with a disease called aplastic anemia. And this is a disease that faces three out of every one million Americans per year. Very rare, very hard to diagnose, and pretty hard to cure, too. After about a year's long journey, um, they did solve for Grady's disease, and it ended up being a stem cell or bone marrow transplant from his father to his son. Uh, his two brothers and his mother were not a match. So the happy ending to this story is that Grady's now uh, about 18 years old. He's happy, he's healthy, he's living a very normal life. Um, but that year-long journey and the potential fatality rate of 90% if you're not properly diagnosed and treated in the first 12 months is super scary. Um, this, is a, this is a rare situation, but it exemplifies what many of us go through in healthcare every year, or our loved ones do. All these diagnoses that are very serious and the challenge of navigating the care system. Um, the meaning of Grand Rounds is actually uh, tied to Johns Hopkins back in the 1920s and it's this idea of all the brightest minds in medicine focused on a single patient to come up with the proper diagnosis and the optimal treatment plan. Uh, so that's really the, where our name comes from. So let's fast forward a little bit from this slide, tell you a little bit more about our company in general. Uh, today we serve 4.7 million members, so um, we started in 2011. We're not very old, but we are pretty large at this point, and you'll see some of the logos up there of employer groups that we service. Some are very large. We have the five largest retailers in America as customers. Uh, I put some other Minnesota logos up there. You probably recognize LifeTouch. They do lots of school and, and uh, church types of photos and yearbooks. Schwann Food Company, they drive those cool red trucks that deliver the really, or the yellow trucks that des deliver that great ice cream sandwich that we all loved as kids. Um, but we also have some other school customers such as Moorhead and White Bear Lake schools who have had some great participation and great success with our program. Uh, in the middle, oh, Sorry. that's all right. Uh, in, the, in the middle we see what we call our institutional partners. So 
Um, we have built this elite network of experts from all around the country that consult remotely on these challenging cases for healthcare. Uh, I'm going to get into how we determine who are the true experts and why that is so important when you're going through <coughs> something rather serious in healthcare. Now we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, do you know if the video will play? I believe so. Okay, so we'll just kind of skip over this. I think one of the best ways to understand how this program works and how impactful it can be for your employees and for our patients is to hear from an actual patient of ours. So this is about a, I think it's a two or three minute video and this really helps to explain how this program works. So we'll pause and listen to this for a moment and then I'll continue. My whole life I've been just an adrenaline junkie. Starting out young as a kid with BMX bicycles. Got my first motorcycle at about 11 years old. Riding motorcycles gave me a, a rush that I couldn't get anywhere else in the world. I was on a road I'd been on a hundred times or more. Car pulled out in front of me. That's where this whole journey began. After about five years, my pain started getting progressively worse. All the fun things in life just kind of went away and I sunk into a really, really dark hole of depression. Hillary is my world, has been my world since the day I met her. She would tell me to be all right. There were times when he couldn't get out of bed or didn't want to, and he's so young that I couldn't imagine him living the rest of his life that way. He was a totally different person, and it was detrimental in our relationship. I work at Comcast, and we have an employee benefit called Grand Rounds. Grand Round took the time to care. I remember the day he came home and was telling me about Grand Rounds. We were at the point where I was, whatever it takes, yes. Um, the expert second opinion from Grand Round flew that and caused my alignment on my body to be thrown out of whack. I had a pinched nerve in my SI joint in my hip instead of what I've been misdiagnosed for years as lower back pain. They wanted to treat it, and that was it. My world got better. So it was a combination of the expert second opinion from Grand Rounds as well as the referral to the, that ended up fixing and eliminating all of my pain. I'm so thankful for Grand Rounds because it gave me my husband back and it really did save our marriage. When one person suffers in a relationship, I would close my hip every 30 days for myself. Her. My whole physical, my whole life I've been active. My world is so active now it's not even funny. I wake up every morning at five o'clock. I never stop. Now I'm a productive, happy employee, whereas before I was just beaten down and tired. I can't express my thanks for Grand Rounds. And for me, Grand Rounds has been amazing. They, they turned my life around. I'm grateful that Comcast offers this benefit to their employees. It's a life changer. It's given me back my life. So it's kind of a touching story and there are many stories like that. It's amazing when you serve 4.7 million members how frequently stories like this uh, our team can share and can tell. Um, we've actually had a number of videos from these larger corporations that they like to share amongst their employees. Like at Costco, if you are shopping there and you see those large break, break rooms, they're often playing a video like that to help educate the employee population about who we are and how we work and uh, when to utilize our program. So we, I want to just share with you a little bit about how we measure the quality of physicians and why that's so important. Um, we have built a process that yeah, go ahead. Um, looks at massive amounts of data. So you really couldn't have started a company like ours until about five or six years ago. 
uh, with the business model that we have. On the left, what you see here is the amount of individual physician level data that has become available and that we can get our hands on and analyze and digest. And so we have 7 billion clinical data points that we're looking at from uh, all different sources, about 42 different categories of data. And what our rule of thumb is is that it has to be predictive of clinical outcomes. So we're not looking at subjective things like some people might look on Yelp or Angie's List or various websites or ask their neighbor across the back fence, who should I go get my knee replacement <coughs> with? And that's a sample size that's very small and it's very subjective. What we're looking at is very scientific information about the actual performance and training, prescription patterns and, and procedure volumes and complication rates that on your own as a patient, you really don't have access to this information. But when we look at this in aggregate across all these different categories and then do this scoring process, what we've done is scored 96% of all the physicians in America. So that whether it's right here in Brainerd, whether it's in the metro, whether you're on vacation in Florida, um, you can feel confident that when you're working with Grand Rounds, we're always guiding you to the top performers for your in-person care. And that when you have something more serious going on and we employ these experts from around the country from these elite medical centers in a remote fashion, that they are truly at the top of their game, most well-educated, best trained, and that they're <clears throat> delivering a proper diagnosis and treatment plan for you. So what we do with all that information is two things. We have constructed this elite expert network that's about 3,000 physicians strong who are at the ready. So for our customers and their employees, it's kind of like having VIP priority access to the brightest minds in medicine, no matter where you are, no matter where they are. And in a matter of days, we're collecting all of your records and with your permission, putting them in front of these brilliant minds in medicine to make sure that you are getting the right diagnosis and the optimal treatment plan. And then we plug you in locally, in network, um, whether that's a mile away or 30 miles away or if it's something really serious and you need to go to the Mayo Clinic, we arrange for that. Um, so the next, the, the scoring process is, you know, the top 0.3% in the country are part of our elite expert network and then um, anytime we're making a guided referral or a match for you to a physician, whether that's primary care, pediatrics, dermatology, cardio, I mean every specialty is covered. We're always ma matching you with somebody who scores in the top 10%. This is what we call a physician scorecard. Um, we actually did one of these for your district as well. And um, this is a, a larger organization, about 20,000 employees, but this is all of the patient to physician visits in a 12 month period. What you see here is that patients and human beings on our own, we don't know how to pick the top performers or the best physicians out there. This is a pretty equal stratification of members visiting physicians and you'll see that there were you know, roughly six, this is a larger population like I said, but 600 visits to really low quality, low performing physicians. Um, in the general medical community, about 3% of all physicians are sanctioned but they're still practicing. Sanctioned is kind of like a conviction within the medical system of doing something, you know, almost like fraudulent billing or prescribing opioids when it's inappropriate or operating on the wrong limb or coming to work intoxicated, like really bad stuff. <laughs> you don't want to see a sanctioned physician. But when you walk through the doors, they don't tell you whether they are or they are not. Our service, of course, uh, weeds them out amongst many other factors and criteria. So the, the matching process that we use is both kind of high tech digesting all of this data, but then each and every patient who works with us gets a three person dedicated team. So we like to say it's kind of like having a doctor in the family. You can call us at any time and work with a, an on staff physician who's dedicated to your case, your journey, whether that's one or two days or sometimes it's three months long. You have a records collection specialist and you have a care coordinator. That three person team is available via phone, via mobile app, via desktop. Um, and you, you stay with that team, so it's not like we're a giant call center and you, you get somebody new every time and have to re-explain your, your situation. Um, you work with the same people and it's unlimited talk time. Sometimes our physicians are talking with patients for over an hour at a time, helping them understand um, what they're going through and answering all of their questions. So the average physician visit these days is about 11 minutes when you go and see your physician. <laughs> Our average call time is 24 minutes, so right there we're spending a lot more time with patients. Okay, this is uh, bringing it home for you. This is the quality scorecard of your own population for the past 12 months. This actually looks better than most, I will tell you. You have quite a bit of green, 
which means 470 visits were in the 75th to 99th percentile of the scoring process that we use. But there's still a lot of room for improvement. You have 500 and something visits that were not in that top quartile, and which um, every time we move people up another decile, there's a significant improvement in aggregate to the outcomes. We also call out here that there were 20 visits to sanctioned physicians by your employees, which is very concerning. And it's, it's something that we would love to help correct that and make sure that those, those physicians are not being seen by your employees. When we break it down by treatment or condition categories, you see here uh, family medicine or primary care is clearly the one that uh, most people have a checkup or wellness visit. Um, you can see there were 71 that were in the top scoring category, which is great, but there were 35 that were in that lowest quartile, so lots of opportunity for improvement there. Um, ultimately, what we see is the, the ability for us to take patients no matter where they live or, or who they're... Um, we, we don't want to disrupt care. If you're with somebody who's you know, at the 80th percentile and they're your primary care physician, you've had them for 10 years, that's healthy, that's good. That's, we're not going to improve your health by moving you from somebody who's an 80 to a 90. But when we have somebody going in for a quadruple bypass or a spinal fusion or a hip replacement or cancer treatment and they're with a 30 or a 60, um, those are the times when it really does matter. There's a significant impact to outcomes, when, even with a 10 or 20 point gain in the physicians that we send you to. Um, so we've talked a little bit about the expert second opinion process. That's a remote process. It's, it happens within days. Um, the office visits is for any and all employees at any time to say, hey, I, I'd like to choose a new primary care physician, or I have a first weird skin rash. I don't know if this is poison ivy or something more serious. Call us, use us, um, help, let us help guide you and, and uh, give you the treatment decision support. That's sort of the wraparound idea that at any point in time you can work with one of our clinicians or physicians. Um, so that's what we call the beacon solution and that's what's um, proposed for implementation. And so we like to take those measurably better physicians and see how they translate into measurably better outcomes. I'll show you just a few slides on specific data points that kind of help prove that this process actually does work and it translates to better outcomes. Uh, the first one here is related to emergency room visits. We all know that those are scary, um, they're very costly, uh, both to us as patients, usually you have a higher copay for that, but also to the plan, they can be very expensive. What happens with patients who use the emergency room but um, have grand rounds and use grand rounds is that in year two, they're 19% less likely <clears throat> to need to go to the emergency room or to use the emergency room, whereas that same patient without the benefit of grand rounds is only a 4% reduction in year two. So 15% across the whole population reduction in emergency room use is, it's significant and there's a lot of dollars to be saved there. A couple of other statistics in our highest categories. This is getting a little bit technical or medical, but uh, musculoskeletal is all those orthopedic things like back surgeries and hip replacements and knee replacements. Um, because we are in a fee-for-service world for healthcare, those are dramatically overdone in our country, those types of surgeries. So 45% of surgical procedures related to orthopedics are canceled as the result of an expert second opinion. There are many types of treatment that you should be trying before you just opt for surgery. But again, like, like I say, because it's a fee-for-service world and some people make a lot of money off of those types of procedures. Um, it's kind of a reality. So we, we help to make sure that we have less invasive approaches that um, people can use. And oncology, about a third of the time, the plan, treatment plan is changed. One last slide on this, the measurably better outcomes. This is really important. We hear about it across the country in Minnesota as well. Um, prescribing of addictive medicines, specifically opioids. Uh, they're you know, they're effective as a painkiller, but they're also very addictive and they're also very expensive. And they are responsible for a lot of deaths and, and uh, substance abuse in Minnesota and uh, more broadly. What we're showing here is that that scoring process that we use, physicians that, let's say, score a 90 out of 100 <coughs> with our quality algorithm scoring process, you see that the amount of prescriptions that they prescribe of these addictive substances is dramatically lower than somebody who's poorly trained, uh, poor performing, poorly scoring in our process. And so it's about a three to five times less likely to prescribe addictive medicines 
when you're a top performer. So again, every patient that we're working with are always matching them with these top performers, even for primary care, which means there's far less exposure to these addictive, expensive, rather dangerous. They're, they're important when you need them, but they're widely overprescribed today. And so finally, how does this all translate into some of these cost savings numbers, uh, the measurably better return on investment as a result of a program like ours? Some of you probably know this, um, that a very small fraction of the employee base is responsible for the vast majority of the healthcare spend. You're not unique. Everybody's something like this, plus or minus a few percentage points. 10% of the population drives 80% of all the spending. So our program is directly targeting and servicing and helping that 10% that's also the most expensive and at risk and in need. And in any given year, that's one person. The next year, it's a different person. It's, um, we're all human. It's no fault of the people that are in the 10%. We all have healthcare needs. Uh, the important thing here is that this is a solution that really didn't exist until about five or seven years ago. So that's, that's why we're here. Um, next slide. When we look at the amount of savings that we can generate on each of these expert second opinion cases, um, the yellow bars represent the range of savings across probably the top 10 or 12 most common high cost claimant or complex um, categories. And so you can see it can be as high as $16,000, $20,000 on a single case. Uh, circulatory is, is less on average. but across all the different categories that we perform this service on, it's almost $9,000 of savings per case on average. And uh, some of the information that National Insurance Services has shared with me is that currently you have 27 high cost claimants that have $50,000 or more in spend per year. So again, you're not necessarily unique with that, but that's, that's the amount of money that's getting spent on healthcare. It's, it's material, it's significant and the ability to save this much money on a single case by guiding them to, to um, better performers and getting them the proper diagnosis and the support during those journeys is a neat opportunity. So finally, uh, we want you to know that there's some transparency and some reporting, both every day you can hop on a dashboard if you're part of the benefits team here mm -hmm. and see the utilization that's being achieved. And then annually, there's a very thorough set of reports <coughs> that we deliver that help you understand how much utilization did your population have and what were the savings associated with all of the interactions that we had with the employees. I guess this is my last slide. Uh, just some final statistics for you. The first one is, I call it my jaw dropper. It's, it's amazing to me, even after four and a half years of working for this company, is that of all the expert second opinions that we perform, two-thirds of the time, there's a significant change to either the diagnosis and or the treatment plan that is recommended by one of these 3,000 most elite experts in the country. So all of us are going through healthcare every day and two-thirds of the time when it's something really serious, there's something that you could probably be doing um, in a more optimal fashion to, to impact your outcome. I won't read through the rest of these statistics. You can, um, you can see those up there. We hit some of those during the presentation, but I'll Maybe take a few questions if there are any, otherwise I'll turn it over to maybe Nancy next or the, the ladies here. I'll just add that, and Sue and Ruth can jump into, as part of the benefit committee, we wanted to, if we, if we do this, um, and it's the recommendation that we do, we need a very big communication plan to get this out to our, our uh, employees and our staff members because they, if, if they don't know about it, they're not gonna use it. And the whole point of it is to save us money, and in order to do that, we need people to utilize it. But um, it's a really great service for the folks that, um, for all of us, um, but especially for the plan, for the folks that are in that 10% that are, are incurring the most costs to help us, them save money and time um, and peace of mind. In that communication plan, NIS did say they've seen it at both work both ways. They've seen a communication plan that's been great and it's been very successful. Mm. And they've seen it where you know it wasn't communicated as well and it's not as successful. So we do need to have a plan. Can, can you share your information on Moorhead? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we spoke with Moorhead Public Schools who has been utilizing this for just over a year, I believe. Um, and they've had tremendous results. They're, they have a three to one return just in the first year of using it. 
Um, and uh, you know, one of their biggest things too is it's very difficult to, they have Sanford and Essentia over in, in Moorhead, and one of the things that's very difficult, and they use the example of a dermatologist, it's very, there's a six month wait to get into dermatology, and if you speak with them and they, you know, they, they think that you may have a reason to be seen faster, they can get you in faster. They don't know how they do it, but <laughs> they, they, they're able to get them a, an appointment within a few weeks versus waiting the six months, um, so. And it's a fixed yearly cost. I think we have to go for a three-year commitment. So yeah, you want more people to use it because the cost is the same. Yeah, and we, we've talked about how we would do that. I would get in front of staff members for sure. And then also um, I'm in charge of the Family Medical Leave Act. And so when people are um, applying for FMLA, we'll tell them about it. We'll explain it to them. We'll explain how this could help their particular situation, um, those types of things. So I think we could, we could market it pretty well. And that was part of the reason we did the extended family when she looked at the staff that we have going on FMLA. You know, it's for some of those extended family members. So it could help us out in that area as well. Yeah, we have a number of folks that take FMLA for parents. Um, we have a number of, of folks that are kind of in that sandwich generation where they're having kids, but yet they have aging parents. Um, and this extended family can be used for parents too, um, which ties back to the need to use sick leave or the need to use FMLA leave to take care of parents if they can get a better diagnosis right away. Um, and a, a different treatment plan is hopefully will help them be at work and be more engaged. Yeah. One thing that Tyler might be able to answer that we mm -hmm. didn't know for sure at the meeting was the definition of an adult child. If you do the extended plan, does, does that child have to live with you or is it any adult child? They don't have to live with you. Um, it's parents, it's siblings, it's in-laws, it's children, it's uh, dependents that are, whether they're tax you know, form types of dependents or in part of your household. That was the confusing part, it said dependents. So most adult children are not dependents. Are they, um, I, mean, I don't think we ever got that answer, do yeah, we? Yeah, we, so I probably shouldn't say this on the record, but we don't really police it very hard. It's not <laughs> some, we don't, we don't, we don't force you to show your birth certificate or your marriage license or any of that kind of stuff. We, <clears throat> um, we thought it made sense if you can do sisters and brothers that you should be able to do adult children too. So yeah. it kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah we, we're really there to, to help anybody who you would consider part of your extended family. Okay. Um, not your neighbors and not your, you yeah. know. <laughs> and how about your mental, exchange students or do you something, have any but. mental health services? I, it, I didn't see it up there, but I thought we talked about that. It's, um, we cover all the different specialty categories. So mental health is okay. part of the program. Uh, we don't have on staff specialists as far as like taking mental health calls over the phone. Like um, it's, it's not that kind of thing, but uh, a lot of mental health, there are some pretty significant prescription and pharmaceutical regimens that people take. And so when we have experts review those, oftentimes they're saying either this is appropriate or wow, this dose is way out of whack or you have too many things going on here. One's conflicting with another. So the benefit of having an expert second opinion, even on a mental health, type of patient can be significant. Well, that's one of the areas we saw costs going up mm -hmm. considerably is mental health. So. Tyler, my question would be, um, you have a primary physician that's recommending a knee replacement and your second opinion coming from the Grand Rounds physician says, no, you don't need it. What if the, the patient says, well, no, I want the knee replacement. What do we do then? So this is where that on-staff physician at Grand Rounds really helps to build consensus amongst the treating physician locally, let's say, the patient and the expert. <coughs> what happens is when we deliver these expert second opinions, uh, the very first page is dedicated to the credentials. So where have they trained? Where do they currently practice? What publications have they done? What clinical trials are they doing? What awards and honors? Um, what literature can they cite to support their perspective on why you should or shouldn't do something? And so we deliver that opinion also to the treating physician locally. And so if they still wonder uh, or, or disagree with what the expert is saying, we can coordinate like a conference call environment amongst the, the physicians so that we don't want the patient sitting in the middle of this getting confused. We want to build consensus and a single best action plan for them that we can communicate. Um, so does that help answer the question? Mm -hmm. They Might. can still choose to have it. Mm -hmm. Like we, you know, there's there's not any anything that the patient still gets to make the, the call. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's so okay. it's not that they have to. This is just a, it's a service to help um, diagnose and help 
Yeah. It's a voluntary opt-in process, and it's, yeah, it's really there to help patients make good decisions. Um, I will tell you that I mentioned the statistic was 66% of the time there's a significant change to diagnosis and or treatment. People often say, well, how often does the patient actually go through with what that change recommendation is? And the, what we call the adherence rate is 84%. So the vast majority of the time, the patients feel confident and certain in the opinion that we've delivered and want to follow through with that. And so we help them take the next steps. But again, it's totally voluntary if they decide, you know what, that's my brother-in-law who's the orthopedic surgeon. I'm going to him for my, nip repla my hip replacement no matter what. Um, they, they can do that for sure. I guess what I really liked about all of this with the grand rounds is that people are going to get probably the proper care and they're going to get healthier sooner. And yes, there's cost-saving measures and all of that, but I think keeping our people healthy is more important. Yeah, and I, I think too, I've, we've had several examples over the years of people just not knowing what's wrong with them, like the gentleman in the video, um, not, uh, not knowing what what their diagnosis is and coming to maybe the local hospital here and not getting an answer and then maybe going to St. Cloud and then maybe going to um, the U of M and then maybe ending up down at Mayo and in the process we've spent time and effort on here, you know, and, and it's worry and it's panic and it's um, along with spending a lot of money whereas Grand Rounds can help get that diagnosed quicker and um, get you to a treating physician who knows what they're doing. Uh, so a quick process question. I'll pull a Charles here. Is this the only time we're visiting about this and we're going to vote next time around? Yes. Is that, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I got a host of questions. I'm not even sure where to start, but mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, we haven't seen any numbers, right? Right. Okay. Because I'm a numbers person would like to understand that. But the business itself, these 3% of in the elite physicians, are these employees of Grand Round? No, they're practicing every day at these elite institutions. So, like I said, Mayo, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, Boston Children's, Massachusetts General. These are these are institutions around the whole country where um, they're academic medical centers. So they're typically at the forefront of the latest endorsed best practices. Um, the statistic is that it takes about 17 years for a newly endorsed best practice to make its way through and become mainstream. So there are hundreds of thousands of physicians that are practicing medicine that's 10, 15, 20 years old when, when we get patients in front of these elite experts with the right diagnosis and that optimal treatment plan, they're getting the latest, greatest. It's not necessarily any more expensive and it's not, it's not that it's uninsured, not, it's not uncovered by the insurance plan, it's just better techniques, uh, better knowledge. So, so what's the process on how, who, who selects that they are the top? 3% elite, is that through the grand rounds or what's the process and how are they compensated? Yeah, that's our proprietary quality algorithm we call it. It's all that data that we're crunching, looking at longitudinal claims data to see what are your complication rates, your infection rates, your readmission rates, when did you adopt a newly endorsed best practice, what are your uh, procedure volumes. You don't want to get a hip replacement from somebody that does one a month. You want somebody that does one day probably and has low complications, low infections. So that's the kind of data that we can see. Um, we are paying them on a per consult basis. So we receive per employee per month revenue at a set fee for the year. And you, we, we hope that we can get your utilization as high as you, as high as you can get it. I mean, it's how we're gonna work together on that, but make sure that there's a, a good return there. Um, so we compensate them for their time and our only directive to them is get this patient the best outcome. So going back to uh, Bob's example, um, so the physician, local physician says we need to do the knee surgery. The expert says we don't. Is the expert, what, where is this expert located and how can they make this determination, and maybe you can do this in the medical world, how can they make that determination without seeing the patient? Yeah, so when we're talking about these serious cases, they've usually been seen by a number of physicians. They've had images and scans and labs and all kinds of different um, write-ups by different physicians and so the first thing that we do is reach out to all the facilities and physicians that they've already been seen by basically their first opinions and we collect all that <clears throat> and we digitize it we organize it our on-staff physicians write up all the notes and summary of the case and then we present that with permission from the patient uh, digitally so it's safe and it's secure to these elite academic medical center experts around the country 
So that's the beauty of this is that from your home on your couch, you can say, I need some help here. I just got diagnosed with cancer and I don't know what to do. And you know, within 10 or 15 minutes of working with Grand Rounds, we then go to work for you. We are your doctor and the family. We're this SWAT team of um, you know, caring, trusted advisors related to your health care to get you the best outcome that take that case and put it in front of these elite experts and then deliver all the results back to you and to your local treating physician. So that ability to help a patient wherever they are to connect with those top performers and brightest minds of medicine, the luminaries of medicine, is really a unique opportunity that, like I say, really didn't exist more than five or seven years ago. How about the numbers? Um, so it would, the contract that we got was about 111,000 per year. And if they do not meet the savings that they, you know, projected, there is a return of a potentially one year, one third of the investment. Over three years then? Yes. Okay. Each year. Oh, okay. Yes. A third each year yeah. if they don't need it. Okay. <clears throat> And it would come out of the self-insurance fund. This is not general fund. You know, that's why it's being presented to the benefits committee. It's a part of our self-insurance. We're thinking, you know, um, all of our claims costs come, we're self-insured, so they come out of our bucket. If we can somehow save on our claims, mm -hmm. it will pay for itself. I'll give you one quick statistic just in those savings numbers. So back surgeries are one of the most overdone procedures in America and when we run the expert second opinion process, 54% of the time when a person was planning to have a surgery, they end up canceling and moving to something far less invasive. The average back surgery in America costs about $22,000. So for most of our customers, there are multiple scenarios per year where that's at hand and moving from, yep, I'm getting back surgery to, nope, I'm gonna move to physical therapy or a cortisone shot or aqua therapy or a bunch of other things that are more appropriate. Um, you can imagine that when you, when, you, um, when you extrapolate that across all the different types of treatments, all, all the savings are not always that high, but you think about you know, 10, 20, 30 cases in a year that are expert second opinion processes, and at the average of $9,000, it doesn't take too long to return that investment of 110,000, and then, as in the Moorhead case, I mean, they're, they're over a three to one return on investment. And there was an example given too that, I mean, we're talking about specialty. Um, our employees can call just for their regular exams and find out, you know, maybe they would recommend a different doctor it, that maybe they're seeing one of those sa sanctioned doctors. Guess what? The thing I'm trying to get my head wrapped around is, if I'm understanding right, 66%, it, it goes a different direction. Yep. So in our medical field, we're saying 66% of all the physicians out there are prescribing something that is not correct or doesn't need to go that route according to these experts. This is for the 10% that drive the 80%, so for the other 90% <coughs> that have basic needs, yep. this, the 66% doesn't necessarily apply to them, just on these really complex right. cases. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, I understand that. And how do we know in such a short period of time that that was the right that was the right change decision because it's only it's only been the last five years so so for, for that top 10 percent the physicians that are working with them are prescribing something and this group of experts are saying 66 percent of the time we shouldn't be doing that. it kind of comes back to that 17 year there's a lot of literature that supports the fact that <clears throat> The, what we call the best, the, the newly endorsed best practices take 17 years to make it into mainstream. So as I said, most physicians, just by those laws of numbers, are practicing medicine that's like 15 years old. Hmm. So when we put these cases for the, the really challenging cancer, quadruple bypass, you know, spinal fusion, hip replacement, pinched nerves, rare diseases like our founder, the average physician has never seen it or seen it three times, but is not a student of that. What we do is find the elite physicians around the country who have spent 20 years studying that particular subspecialty within medicine, and they're at an elite academic medical center where they're given time to research that, to, to do trials, to, 
just become long and deep and really specialized in that one thing. And our ability to, at scale across the whole country, connect these patient cases with whoever that genius is in the one area, that's the difference between going to the chair of pancreatic surgery at Johns Hopkins versus the person down the road that's an oncologist and they see two pancreatic cancer cases per year. The chair does it every single day, three times a day, and has spent their whole life studying that. The oncologist down the road sees two a month or two a year. That's, a, that's probably the and best way I could It was it. Mayo Clinic that was on one of your slides, right? So what's, the, the, they're an endorsement of the program or how? They're what we call an institutional access partner. And so we have the ability to <clears throat> in, invite. So our expert panel of 3,000 is by invitation only. You cannot apply. You can't buy a plaque. Um, you have to be invited by us based on all of our research to be part of our elite expert opinion panel. Um, so Mayo Clinic, what that does for us to be an institutional partner is allows us to collect records. We can basically press a button and collect all of your records if you're having Okay, so this is there. where you're getting a lot of data from them on other clinics. It's where we get data. It's where we get some of our experts that we want. And it's also how we have that, um, what, what I would say, kind of like the priority access. If you call on your own and you were just diagnosed with cancer, you're probably going to be told it's going to be five weeks before you can get in. When you call Grand Rounds and say, I just got diagnosed with cancer, it's a rare form, and we determine we think you should get to Mayo, and you have that, if you have that coverage in your network, we can guarantee you a specialist appointment in three to 10 days. Hmm. So that's a really valuable and unique opportunity that um, I, I don't think you can get anywhere else unless you knew somebody that worked there and they could pull some strings. But that's because we deliver appropriate patients well prepared to these institutions, they're willing to give us that kind of access. Sorry, one more question. Well, how does it, oh, go ahead. Yes, so sure. what, 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 oh, I'm, <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Would it be fair to say that our local hospitals, clinics would endorse this? <laughs> the reality is, is they don't, um, people sometimes say, well, <clears throat> do the local physicians know when a patient, do they know what their score is? That's a question we get a lot. Does, does Dr. Smith you know, down the road here. Do they know what their score is with Grand Rounds? Do they know who Grand Rounds is? Do they, um, are they afraid that they're missing out on patients because you're sending them elsewhere? The reality is, is that for local care, they rarely know that the patient ended up at their clinic because of us. They do if we sent them the expert second opinion report or we transferred a bunch of their records there in anticipation of them doing the treatment. They, they sometimes see our name. But otherwise, it's, that's the objectivity of this is that they can't pay us, and we're not paying them any, any amount of money. This is truly a very objective, scientific method to guide patients to top performers. Um, the experts, like I said, they're getting a consult fee from us because they're full-time employed. I'm sure they're doing just fine if you're the chair of pancreatic surgery at Johns Hopkins. Um, <laughs> but they look at us as this nationwide funnel, and they say, I've studied 30 years. <clears throat> I'm one of the best in my field. Um, I've written textbooks. I run clinical trials. I want to do more impact but I only have so many hours in a day. So when we give them a really challenging case from rural Louisiana or rural Minnesota that normally they only see patients within a 50 mile radius of their facility, they're ecstatic to be able to know they can help properly diagnose and set up a treatment plan that's gonna maybe save somebody's life or dramatically alter their life. Um, so that sometimes people say, why do experts wanna work with you? That's one of the reasons why. I just wanna share, I have a family member that has used Grand Rounds and he had a very difficult case. Um, I can't go through his medical condition, uh, but he was at the end of his rope, and he worked for one of the companies that was on your board, and uh, it, it ended up being an East Coast physician, I can't remember from where, but it really was very helpful in solving his problem. And then he worked with local doctors, right? He worked with local doctors. Yeah. And yeah. I would guess those local doctors would be ecstatic to have mm -hmm. someone like that. Yeah, they were. I mean, because it was an expert that, yeah. a, a couple experts actually, it was more than one that looked at it. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing. And that's, um, I would say that's a pretty typical reaction. The, the physician community, they all want the best outcome for a patient. And they recognize that. Because they it, couldn't figure it out. They all only have, you know, X amount of time and specialization. So again, the ability to get that case in front of an elite expert who's spent their whole life uh, becoming brilliant at that one subject, oftentimes the 
the folks that are um, in our communities, they're looking at this resume and they're saying, wow, I, I saw this person speak at the National Convention for Cardiology last year, or I read a couple articles in the Journal of American Medicine by this author. They're pretty excited to be able to work with that caliber of expert. Um, they, they often do know who these people are, and if they don't, they're still just really impressed by the resume and um, typically welcome that involvement. It's a lot of pressure when you have a challenging case, one that you can't diagnose or one that's just life-threatening or um, debilitating, and as that physician to try to figure out what's going on and bring the best possible care, it's a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, and so to have somebody who's a national expert weigh in within days or a week or two is, um, it's appreciated. So um, Ruth and Sue had both asked that we present tonight, and then um, we will do our usual health insurance update next month, so you would see a contract for them for approval, um, and it was the recommendation of the committee to move forward with this. I think we've been talking about Grand Rounds for two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is this wasn't just a, a new thing. We've been talking about this for since I've been here. I can't believe that it's um, being uh, in rural Minnesota. I mean, this family members down in the cities. So, yeah, that's pretty cool that you guys are. <coughs> Just in a really quick thing, is White Bear Lake, do they have the same results that Moorhead has been having, their school district? I wouldn't say the same as Moorhead. Um, I think the reference to communication is um, probably associated with them. Um, okay. We work in tandem to build a calendar of multiple channels, so digital, print, in-person, um, and frequency. There's, there's a lot of work that we do to try to implement a calendar of uh, engagement, we call it, to drive sufficient utilization. And there was just some stops and starts there. That had, I think there was some um, staff turnover that kind of put things on hold for a while. I could tell you that uh, another probably comparable, more rural district, uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, is another customer of ours, and they're right on par with Moorhead. Maybe even maybe even better results. Thank you. Very good. And then I was just going to give a quick update on what else we discussed because that was one topic. Um, and then next month we'll also look at premium, setting our premiums for the following year. Uh, NIS did come with a recommendation after looking at all of our results of 5.2. However, um, a lot of our contracts, the contribution amounts were based on an estimated 7.3. So it is the uh, Benefits Committee recommendation to go with the 7.3. We will vote on that again in yes. May. Yes, correct. correct, correct. And then there'll also possibly be a vision. Eye vision yes, plan. an option that is totally um, uh, an individual can sign up for. The district does not have any type of contribution for that. And then also we will look at our administrative services with Medica, renewing that for our third year. Ruth, what was that that you said? Vision. Vision, vision, plan. vision plan. Vision plan. Oh, okay. Got it. Just offering a plan that is available to employees. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so moving right along here, new business. We have some action items. First up is the approval for the 2018 calendar. <laughs> I would be happy to. I just want to assure everyone that we have had our last snow day for the 18-19 school year. Please quote that in the paper. Yeah. We've, we've, we're done with snow days as of this one until December of 2019, I, we hope, but or maybe even later. Um, but we did have a snow day a couple weeks ago, and contractually we need to make a recommendation um, as to what to do with that snow day. And so we've um, really been tossing and turning what, what the best option is because we know that um, we've already added four days to our calendar. We also know that we have a building project where um, Justin just shared with us that we've got several of our buildings uh, starting their ground breaking and starting building on June 3rd. And so we need to make sure that we have our staff and our children and everybody ready to go so that our construction can begin. And so we've had a long conversation about what should we do with this extra day that we have 
a, a contractual responsibility uh, within Minnesota to, to fulfill the contract. Uh, one of the things that I did today is I did call uh, Chris Lindholm, the superintendent in Pequot Lakes, because I read um, that they, along with Pine River, had been making some um, decisions what they were going to do with their fifth day as well. And um, what they are doing is adding it onto their calendar, so they're going five full days the week um, that, that we, um, our last, same last week that we have on our calendar. Um, just a little bit ago, Janet just uh, handed out a copy of the calendar that you all approved. Um, I believe it was in March when we finalized this calendar. But you can see that uh, May 25th is Memorial Day, 26th and 27th were snow makeup days along with the 22nd. And then on the, um, there's a little slash across the 29th depending if we had an extra day or not. Whoops. Yeah, I'm looking at the, whoops, that's the wrong calendar. <laughs> Take a look at that one. So, yep. well, I can still do. Thank you very much. Yep, that was the wrong calendar. That was next year's calendar. <laughs> We're messed up with these calendars, let me tell you. Okay, here we go. This makes more sense when I look at this, but this one isn't accurate either because this has the, the four days plus the fifth day on May 31st, um, plus four days in June, and then the half day of teacher workshop. But what my recommendation is tonight is that we keep the calendar as approved in March, which would mean we have a student contact day on Friday the 31st, teacher workshop on the 3rd and the 4th, professional development opportunities that we're going to have at that time. The 5th is a packing day, and then there will be a half a day on the 6th, which is that half a day of teacher workshop um, that we have built into our calendar. Again, this was the calendar that I was contemplating last week, but after meeting with Meet and Confer, um, I really believe that this last snow day that we need to make up is better off to be used next year. And so what I'd like to recommend the Board of Education um, approve tonight is that we allow our certified staff to make up those eight hours during next school year um, in one of three areas. Uh, first of all, uh, packing and moving, because we know we're going to have a lot of that to do, both on the front end of moving out of our buildings and then packing and moving to bring things back into our buildings in August. Um, also, we know that our district is really short of professional development opportunities, so I think that that would certainly be a great use where staff could do some additional professional development and we could take some of those hours and put that towards it. And the third option is that the new uh, licenses that have to be approved in this next round of licenses through the Minnesota Department of Education, um, there's an element of cultural co um, competency training that must be completed. And I would like that to be a third option that our staff that goes and gets some additional training in the areas of cultural competency that, that could be put uh, towards these eight hours. We all know that our staff put in many, many, many extra hours of time um, every single year that uh, they're giving on behalf of our children in our district. And this way they can um, just account for some of those hours in those three areas uh, in the 1920 school year. And I have checked to make sure that this is doable, and it is, it's legal to do this. Um, and we still have plenty of days in our calendar, we have plenty of hours in our calendar. And I really believe that this would be the best use of our time rather than adding on another day that first week in June when we already have the shovels in the ground, we already have construction beginning, and many of our people have to be out of their buildings anyway. So that is my recommendation. So that won't be a one specific designated day. It'll be nope. a day that nope. they and every staff can kind of can work with their principal on. Can work with their principal, and it'll be a little bit of a uh, not. It'll it'll be a little bit confusing as far as organizational piece. But we did talk at meet and confer about having a sheet with the different areas that would be acceptable, and uh, staff could identify. I had two hours in professional development with such and such a training on this day and four days of packing and moving on this day and just turn it in and their eight hours would be accounted for. So, 
like I said, we know that <coughs> our staff gives way more than that. And so um, this just meets the contractual obligation, but it still is really hel um, helpful to us next year. Are we still um, above the at or above the number of days required? Yeah. So we're we about three days above it, whereas many of the districts that we're talking about, they have to put in these days and they have to bring other staff back for professional development or something um, to meet up with the legislation change that was approved. Great. But we're okay because we have more days in our school calendar than many districts in the state. So, Very good. Yep. So is there a motion? I so move to approve the calendar as presented with the uh, Fifth day into next year. Thank you. Second. Thank you. We have a first from Director Campbell, a second from Director Blacklands. Any further discussion? Just uh, one comment. I might would be interested when we look at um, renewing contracts, you know, the teachers' contracts, to even bring them into the loop for some future as you know, when this might happen again what some other options might be, if there's some PTO time that could be taken. Uh, I'm not real keen about just kind of making up some s things for them to do. I realize this is a little bit unique, but you know, maybe there's a number of teachers that w or certified staff that would say, you know, why don't you just not pay me for that day, as an yeah. example. So at least for discussion purposes as we're visiting with them. Mm -hmm. One option I think that will possibly be an, an option in the near future with our one-to-one -one technology that Sarah has been working so hard with. I forget the name of the days, but through MDE right now, you can have like tech days um, where you identify those days where there can be assignments and such done with your technology at home. And again, our, um, our student today talked a little bit about that. There's some logistics that we need to iron out. But I certainly see that that could be a possibility in the future if everybody has a device. Mm -hmm. That if you have an extra day or two that you need to uh, figure out that you could have those technology days. That might just be an option. And then again, the other thing is, I know Ruth, you had brought up that next year you'd like to see some snow days kind of built in a little bit. It might be a little hard next year, but in the right. near future. Right, I think once the building projects and we don't have to have short years, we need to get back to building at least two snow days. I agree with you. Yeah. 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 And again, we, we do sit down with Ed Minnesota and talk about what the calendars get their input and such each year before we bring the calendars forward. But like you said, they're, they're going to be a little bit odd, the calendars, for the next couple of years, and then we'll be back to normal again. So, thank you. OK. Any further discussion? Do we need to talk about this 1920 calendar? Nope, that'll be no, just fine. No mistake, I printed the wrong one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm it like, this doesn't <laughs> feel right. <laughs> I'm trying to get too to organized yeah. the wrong way. That was fun. Okay, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Now, next up, the approval of the resolution awarding the sale, determining the form and details the execution, delivery, and registration, and providing for the payment of general obligation facility maintenance and tax abatement bonds, 2019A. Marcy and Greg, help us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a good day. Yes. I brought a friend. Oh, good. My pile's getting high, so uh, <laughs> uh, I introduced Matthew Hammy to you all. He's a pretty face tonight, <laughs> but... Uh, he, um, I'm not Matthew Hammer. Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> he just joined us in December, and uh, he's he's uh, been enjoying getting to while we're kind of at the tail end of the financing, kind of seeing how all the puzzle pieces fit together. And uh, um, it's a you know, as you all know, it's an exciting, fun, interesting project. So I'm glad he's been able to yeah. to chip in and help out. So it was even exciting today. <laughs> yeah, so we'll get into that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, well, we'll give you the punchline first, and we'll run through both bond sales. You, you mentioned the first resolution, but we had, we had two uh, bond sales today. Um, if you remember, and you probably don't remember, back to a year and a half ago when we originally set up this financing, we expected interest rates of over 3.5% for these two particular pieces of financing. Last month when I was here, 
Um, we told you that the rates would come in in this market probably at about 3.23 for the 2019A bond and or vice versa, 3.03 and then 3.23 for the 2019B certificates of participation. So the punchline is that we got great bids today and the 2019A came in at 2.71% and the 2019B at 2.83%. So, so super rates. Um, we did do uh, some juggling today in terms of bond size. And part of that is to make sure that we're giving you the most flexibility uh, while you know, keeping the tax impact under that $7 that we promised to the voters to give you the most flexibility on spending. And then we also had, and you may have run into this when you're bidding construction projects too, we had a bidder um, that, that didn't read the bid parameters very carefully and um, bid uh, the bond, uh, the certificates of participation, assuming that it had that AAA credit enhancement rating. Since it's a GO bond, it did not. Uh, it only carried the district's rating, uh, and so they asked to withdraw their bid. And they were pretty close to the second and third bidders, which were almost identical. Um, so after some conversations with Marcy about the pros and the cons and the potential risk, the biggest one being that if they decided in the next month before they gave you the check that they would back out of the closing, we'd have to rebid, and who knows where the market would be then. We just decided um, uh, that you know, the, the other bids were so good that it was okay to let them withdraw uh, their bid. And um, by the time we found that out, the second bidder, as I said, was almost identical to the third bidder. Um, they had moved on to other financing, so allowed them to withdraw as well. But again, that 2.83 rate was basically the same between the second and third. So the low bidder on the, on the COP is Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And we can look at the details a little bit. You have the sale day reports. <laughs> So that was our excitement on the bidding side. And then on the how big should the bonds be side, side um, if you remember, this, the 2019A is a combination of facilities, maintenance, and abatement bonds. And uh, the B is lease purchases for building additions. Abatement bonds can only be used for parking lots. And there's still some, because of all the issues related to the parking lots, there's still some uncertainty about how big that budget should be. So. Um, what we decided to do today was increase the size of the certificates of participation because those building additions basically can only be funded with either voter approved bonds or certificates of participation. And this is the only certificate of participation that we're planning to issue. So if we issue more of those, that frees up that amount on the voter approved bonds. And that can be used for anything. If you need a little more for parking lots, then we've freed up that money and you can use it for parking lots. If we had as much in parking lots and you didn't have that much to spend on parking lots, that money kind of sits there. And so we just kind of wanted to make sure we had given you the most flexibility kind of on the spending side then too. So you'll see a couple differences. Um, so the 2019A, the 20 million 255, if you look on the uh, inside cover, uh, you see that we have 10 bids for that and the low bidder was Baird out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, as I, I mentioned, the, the low bid is two point, was 2.76, uh, roughly. And uh, in the note, you see that um, the bond size was decreased to reduce the amount of funds deposited to the construction fund for parking lots. And then in addition, remember we always talk about the premium. The premium was a little higher than we expected uh, from the pre-sale. And so we could use some of that premium as well for projects or for cost of issuance. So ultimately, we were planning to issue $20.9 million in bonds and we issued $20.255. And finance basically the same amount of projects on the facilities maintenance side, actually a couple hundred thousand dollars more, and then about $500,000 less on the abatement side. And we have a note there about the true interest cost being lower. We didn't calculate the savings because we're issuing less, so you're saving because there's lower principal and there's less interest as well. But compared to what we had originally projected, significantly lower principal mm. and interest payments. So uh, the attachments, uh, really just the details of the bids, and you've seen those before. If you look at page three, that's the sources and uses. And so on the abatement side, this big bold line right here in the middle that says how much is available for projects. <laughs> $5 million for the abatement bonds. 
and we had originally planned to be about eight million in the original budget, mm -hmm. now at five and a half in the pre-sale. We could still do another abatement bond issue if the parking lot budget comes in um, higher than this. There's a little bit of room left to issue additional bonds with the tax impact and stay under that seven dollars. But again, we didn't want to overcommit at this time on the abatement front. And then the sixteen point two million dollars on the facilities maintenance side, that's a few hundred thousand dollars more uh, given how good the bids were than what we had projected in the pre-sale. And then there's a lot of small print, boring stuff, um, four and five payment schedules. Um, I just like to go to the picture to remind you all where we're at. So on page seven is the picture, and these new financings we're talking about today are the yellow, orange, and blue. And you can see we're actually even still a little bit low, below that seven dollar impact and so um, you all are doing fabulous in your bond sales and um, uh, we're, we're meeting the project budget needs and we'll have the ability um, to you can see that the line actually dips a little bit below so if we get to the point in the next 12 months where we need to issue something with the tax impact there's a little bit of capacity to do that um, but then we also we have not sold about eight and a half million dollars of bonds that don't have a tax impact. Uh, four million or so out of the, or seven and a half, four million or so out of facilities maintenance revenue that's funded with your deferred maintenance revenue and about three and a half million of capital facility bonds which are funded out of your operating capital revenue. So those are the only pieces that are left, um, um, but we wanted to leave those until the last as the budget developed uh, just to see where everything landed, okay? Uh, then there's a rating report that applies to both bonds, starting on page 8, the bonds and the certificates. And uh, no surprises there. They kept your rating at the A rating that you received back when with the voter approved bonds. We were very upfront with how much debt the district was going to incur, and um, they're comfortable with that. Um, I'll note that the rating on the COPs is always notched down one notch, and we talked about that last month because it's a annual appropriation bond, not a general obligation bond. So that's an A minus versus an A for the, um, for the facilities maintenance bond. And I'll just jump to the report on the B um, if you want me to, and then you can take your action. So B, nothing extra there. Um, you see uh, on page one, we're under the number of bids for, that's where we note about the, um, uh, the withdrawal of the two bids. Um, and I'll even note, just to give you a sense of the market, we sold a $5 million certificate for the Lakeville School District for a building addition about two or three weeks ago. And they basically got this exact same interest rate. They're rated a little higher than you, and theirs were bank qualified, which usually gets better rates. So this is, this is a, even all that considered is, is a really good interest rate. So that's kind of market evidence that, that um, even though you had those two withdrawals, that the interest rate is great still. So, so we're happy to see it. Um, and then uh, the other consideration is uh, you can see in the debt structure, and the bids are listed on page uh, one of the attachments. And again, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch was the low bidder. Um, but then on page three, uh, you can see in the bold there uh, about $10.1 million available for building additions. And that number in the pre-sale was closer to uh, a little over $8 million. So that's where the extra funding came in for this purpose um, that basically we added in today. Uh, and the bank was willing to do that because we just thought we're getting good rates. It's more flexible funding. Let's take advantage of that because we're not going out in the markets with COPs again. So, um, and again, then a, a principal and interest payment schedule. Uh, the first, uh, if you're paying attention, the first two payments uh, from last time are about this, um, uh, but the last payments are a little higher. And the reason for that is you're using some of your lease levy capacity right now. So we wanted to keep the first two payments down. Let's keep you under that per pupil. You have a $212 per pupil limit on how much lease levy you can use, which is what these fund. And we've left twenty-five dollars to $30,000 of extra in case you enter into a lease for anything else, just to make sure we're not committing everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, gets used for things besides this, like the ice arena and the ski hill lease that you, yeah. So, so we just want to make sure you have a little bit of flexibility and, and um, so you'll see the payments a little bit different, but otherwise it's level after those, uh, <coughs> pretty much totally level after those first two years. 
So that's everything. Um, things are things are coming together like we expected. Um, I do have a couple of things to sign before we leave tonight, but um, we'll leave the big packet so you can close on $30 million and get everything set uh, with Janet probably and make sure you get all the, all the signatures and nobody leaves until everything's signed. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? So Greg, bond A is for buildings, correct? Yep. Okay, so that um, 0.3% that we saved over what you thought it would be, that's about $60,000 a year. So that'd be over a million dollars over the course. So can we can use that extra if, if in our yeah, buildings? Yes, so, that's, so that what's, that's what's coming into play why, the, why there's still a little bit of a dip in the, below the $7. That if potentially, if we needed to do a little more on abatements or a little more, because by adding the $2 million, we've kind of gotten pretty close to what we had expected to issue uh, up to this to date. But if you need a little more on abatements for parking lots, and the other piece would be for um, facilities maintenance bonds for indoor air quality, which is what this is. That comes out of tax levy, not out of your existing revenue. So those are the two main levers that we could pull if we needed a little bit more funding uh, and still, you know, fairly broad use and costs that you probably still have. So, yep. And the certificates of participation are for additions to the building. So, with the numbers that Brandon has run, he's pretty confident that the 10 million we're comfortable with. The abatement piece we're still working on, and so originally the plan was about 8 million in abatement. That's why we lowered that number because we're still working on trying to figure out what that final number looks like. And rather than issue 8 million in abatement and have our you know projected cost be six, right. we're, we're just sticking with that five. But why did we have 8 million in? Abatement. Estimates, yeah. Well, oh, then we had our, our change with all of the city of Brainerd yeah. changes where we had to reduce oh, our Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, right. So there's been some changes since that original plan. It's okay to have some savings. We don't mm -hmm. have to spend everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah. do agree with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, great. Good. Yeah, good. Good. Yeah, good. Good. Right. Great news. Yeah. Thank, thank you. You, you guys, thank you. Really you. been working today because this how this we all were scrambling. got finalized like eleven o'clock, and they had to finalize it and get here from the cities. Oh. So huh. they have been cruising to make sh yeah. be prepared tonight. So thank we you. Wanna, we were like that analogy about the duck, you know that. Everything's calm above the water and below the paddle. Like <laughs> we just want you to see the calm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay. So we need a motion, right? To approve yes, the resolution do. awarding the sale of the general obligation facilities maintenance and tax abatement bond series 2019A. And to authorize the execution, delivery, and registration of those. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? We have first from Director Nelson, a second from Director Nystrom. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. We'll need a roll call. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. Roll call. Vote. Reed Campbell? Yes. Tom Hagelin? Yes. Sue Kern? Yes. Ruth Nelson? Yes. Bob Nystrom? Yes. Charles Blacklands? Yes. All approved. All in favor. Thank you. Now we need another motion. Uh, I so move the approval of the resolution for series 2019B as presented. Very good. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none. We are going to a roll call vote. <laughs> Tom Hagelin? Yes. Sue Kern? Yes. Ruth Nelson? Yes. Bob Nystrom? Yes. Charles Black Lance? Yes. Reed Campbell? Yes. All in favor. Thank you. There we go. Thanks, guys. Now we have some Thank informational you. pieces. Thank Marcy, you. Thank you. Drive safely. Thanks, Greg. Now, Thank you. Do you have to sign that? Marcy, you got all this down there. You got this. I'll make sense. I'm the treasurer, but I think it's the clerk. 
It's Jerry Clerk. In St. Paul? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great night, everybody. Drive carefully. Yeah. 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 yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> Got him. Good night. Good night. <coughs> And all Thank I have for um, business services report, the financial report will be ready on the May 13th uh, board meeting. So any question, and the insurance update will be next month as well, as I said. So if there's any questions ahead of time, let me know, but there'll be more information in your board packet. Marcia, on that insurance piece, can you send us the numbers and a little bit how the savings is calculated then, mm -hmm. that piece? Yep. Thanks. Okay. Will do. Thank you. Thank you, Mercy. Superintendent's report. A couple of things that I'd like to add. Um, last Monday evening, um, we had the Baxter Improvement Hearing, and then on Tuesday night, um, as Brad told you, we were really excited because uh, basically everything got approved with the Baxter Elementary School and Forest View. We have that one little area on what we're gonna do with the road on Knollwood, but other than that, everything's a done deal. And so that's very exciting. And that being said, on Monday evening, we attended the Brainerd City Council meeting as well to finalize the details. And I just got notice today that at that meeting, and we knew it that night, they approved the rezoning request that we had off of Oak Street um, from a B2 to an R2. So we are ready to go with um, Harrison Elementary School, and also they approved the conditional <coughs> use permit for the properties identified in the application near Harrison Elementary School. So things are really happening. We're getting all those fine details that are kind of the behind the scenes types of items that have to be done to make it happen. So we're gonna be ready on June 3rd and ready to rock and roll, and, and uh, then, then the fun begins. So um, other than that, Everything that I have has either been talked about tonight or um, you read it in your memo last weekend or we've got some looking ahead dates that I know Sue will bring us through in a little bit. So um, in the idea of time, we'll uh, shorten my report tonight. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Future board meetings, April 29th, lunch with Lane at Lowell. I guess we know who goes there. Yeah. Also, April 29th, Community Ed Advisory Council meeting in Washington. Um, Fall Sports Banquet at 515, reception and dinner. May 6th, Fine Arts Reception at the high school, 7 p.m. May 13th, our regular school board meeting. May 21st, we have groundbreaking at Baxter Elementary. May 22nd, groundbreaking at Harrison. And May 23rd, groundbreaking at Nisswa. All of those are at 9.30 in the morning. And if the board is available to come, um, we should advertise those as public meetings um, because we'll have a shovel for you to help break the ground that we have at each of those sites. So it's going to be three really big days. So anyway, we'd love to have everyone come. There's going to be some speakers and uh, kids are gonna do some great performances at all of our schools. Tammy's shaking her head. and I know there's lots of excitement because they're gonna be really fun, front, fun groundbreakings. And they'll be about 30 minutes, not a big lengthy thing. But if you can make it, please put that on your calendar. What do you, what do you wear to a groundbreaking? Uh, like top if, it's, if it's cold, you wear a coat. <laughs> <laughs> in your work boots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
you can <laughs> if it, it helps you put your Thank shovel you. in your ground so anyway okay. it'll be fun and we'll have the media there and hopefully get some great pictures and really make it a day that we remember each of those days historic day in the in our school district very good um, I don't believe there's any other business. We are going to move into closed session pursuant to Minnesota statutes 13.44 to discuss appraised values of private property and negotiations for the purchase of property and 13D.05 subdivision 3 for data classified as not public to develop and or consider offers or counter offers for the purchase or sale of real or personal property yep. at 619 4th Avenue Northeast and 505 16th Street Southeast both Brainerd I'll make that motion that we move into closed session thank you second okay we have a first from director Nystrom a second from director Haglin those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And we are going into closed session. Mm -hmm.